Welcome to the live stream, the podcast, whatever you want to call it. It's 9.30 in the morning here in Sydney at least and thank you very much for joining me in today's show. I want to bring you a few things today. I've got this compendium of latest developments of automotive news coming up. There's an absurd report from Ford, for example, as well as the official announcement of the Hyundai Palisade and Santa Fe. I saw a Kia Carnival in the flesh, the new one. The launch for that, of course, is coming up on the 5th of January, first day back in business or the second day back in business after the festivities. So they're obviously getting serious about that. And I saw one out and about in reality. I'll tell you what I thought of that. And I want to mention this as well. This thing here is a brilliant, literally, development. It's I've had one for a few weeks now. It's called the Olight Freya. And uh, it's been under embargo, and the embargo lifted at midnight. And the reason I want to talk to you about it now is, A, I needed my beauty sleep, and even <laughs> ineffective though it was, clearly. And uh, I didn't want to talk to you about it at midnight, right? But this is a really solid automotive torch. Like, it's got some great built-in automotive-specific functionality, which we might as well unbox and get into kind of now, if that, as long as that's okay with you. And then after we run through this news at uh, after that, uh, we'll take your questions and, uh, you know, whatever you want to ask me in the automotive domain, if you've got some sort of burning question or, you know, electron question about modern cars, let me know and uh, I'll do my best to answer it if you're stumped about which car to select or you want to know about this automotive tech or that I can't promise to be able to answer everything but I will try and help you if I possibly can. Uh, now getting back to this flashlight, the Olight Freya, I kind of set up this dodgy dual camera setup here so that you can actually see me unbox it. And I'd suggest it's a, a pretty cool present. There's 40% off right at the moment on the Olight Freya, and that will be until midnight tonight. And that brings the price down to about 135 bucks Australian, right? Which is not dirt cheap, but it's not over the top for a present either, particularly for some automotive specific somebody in your life. So let's get right into it now and the first thing that's going to strike you particularly if it is a present is the packaging is so slick okay it feels like a quality product as soon as you touch the box and the box is actually so good I feel guilty or at least borderline guilty about throwing it away now immediately in top is uh, some disposable destruction so We'll get rid of that. I have actually read them and been playing with the torch for a while. But what's most exciting, I suppose, about this torch is it's got this brilliant built-in silicon sleeve for the frayer, which turns it into a signalling device as well as a conventional flashlight, right? So I, f I think that's really clever. And cameras never show this stuff properly, you know, but it's actually red and you can cycle through all the colors right you can get green you can have blue and you can have white as well and you know you can have really bright white and you can have super bright white there's actually a proximity sensor in the uh, torch head as well so that when you put the sleeve in it detects that and it uh, reduces the intensity so that you won't uh, overheat the torch when you've got the sleeve on top and the sleeve seems pretty durable it's that really solid silicon rubber and frankly, the whole thing just feels like it's been well thought out by dudes who know their stuff. What you can see here, obviously, is the internal layout, and I hope you can uh, you can see that all right. There's the central white LED and that black dot right on top about here. Uh, let me get that right. About here <laughs> is the proximity sensor, and then the three LEDs, at spaced at about 120 degrees apart here are the red, green and blue LEDs. So I just want to run through the specs. I've made some notes here because there's a lot of tech built into this torch and uh, I, I just wanted to n not forget anything basically and overlook it. Now it's about five inches long, hundred and five and a half inches long. It's about 136 millimeters, and it weighs only 200 grams. So it's very small and compact. Even though I guess in the box it looks somewhat bigger than that. You get the white, green, red, blue, and the silicon traffic wand included, and it's ideal. Therefore, if you're in the business of doing something like general signalling, 
you know? Like, there are plenty of people who need to signal this and that in their daily lives. And, you know, if, if you had any sort of requirement to do that, to just wave it, whatever, then this flashlight is really good at that and the silicon wand just goes on so easily. It fits in the uh, holster supplied, so that's pretty good. The beam, when you're using it just as a conventional flashlight, right, the beam, let me just go into conventional flashlight mode here, the beam is a sort of spot beam in the centre with a wide flood around it as well. So it's just right for general flashlight work. It's not too tight, in other words. It's a it's a general sort of uh, use beam at those conventional sort of less than 50 metres. Although when it's really bright at uh, 1750 lumen mode, it's, you know, virtually a laser beam. And it... Uh, It'll run like that for as many as two minutes and then in the first mode it'll default to a lower setting until the battery runs flat. So I'll talk to you about all of that stuff. It's got seven modes, right? Mode number one is a... Uh, mode number one is the bright mode. 1750 lumens, it'll run like that for two minutes and then it drops to 850 lumens which it'll run at for two and a half hours. 1750 lumens is very bright indeed, okay? And that's uh, that's essentially good enough to throw the beam 360 meters down there. And you probably don't ever need to look at something that far away with a torch such as this. At least most people wouldn't. But then when it drops down to 850 after the first two minutes, it'll run like that for two and a half hours. And it doesn't even go flat then. It'll run at 300 lumens for an additional 30 minutes. So in mode one in total, Total, you'll get slightly over three hours of total runtime. If you elect mode two in the white mode, it'll run at 300 lumens for nine and a half hours. So that's probably excessive to your requirements as well. And then mode three, which is kind of interesting as well, is this sort of firefly mode, you know, the, the moonlight mode, whatever they call it, which is just right for casting a very gentle beam and doesn't ruin your night vision. So that's pretty clever as well. You can also lock out the side switch. You can lock out the whole torch so that you can't accidentally run it flat by heavy something, whatever, pressing on either of the two switches in your bag. And that's dead easy to do too. You just press this side switch and hold it for two seconds and then the functionality is locked out. And no matter how you try and turn it on, it won't turn on until you press and hold for another second. So that's pretty clever, I'd suggest. And that means you'll never just reach for it and it'll be dead flat. And my cunning plan for this would be just to leave it in the car connected to the super clever magnetic charging base. So USB-A at one end, you've got your, your USB-A connection at one end of the cable. I hope you can see that okay. And then you've got your magnetic charging base at the other end. And these days, of course, most cars have the USB connection in the center console or below the, the fascia there at the in the center. And... To connect the torch it's just brilliant right so just moving on with the specs here you've got your other color modes you get red green and blue and the red is really clever okay you get 30 lumens of red light i'll just make that work hopefully i'll just make that work i said <laughs> i'll just make that work there we go red green and blue just like that here's green for example it's hard to show this stuff on a conventional video camera because of the brightness, the relative brightness intensities. But when you you just press and hold the side switch and it cycles through blue, then you go back to white and finally red and green. You can cycle through the whole lot. It's a disco. Play that funky music, white boy. Right, so that's basically the functionality laid right out there. Now... In mode, there's another mode as well, obviously, you can triple click this and you, you get a strobe, which is 1750 lumens at 13 hertz. So there's seven different modes all up. Now the red light is really good for night vision, okay? If you're walking around in the bush ever, it's really good not for destroying your night vision to walk around with the red light. And I've done that extensively with red torches, gone for long bushwalks at night. And red really is great because there are times when you want to look beyond the beam or at the side of the beam. And if you use a white light, your night vision is basically destroyed and you're required to, m to move the flashlight a lot so that the white light is everywhere because outside the beam you can see nothing. Whereas if you walk on a red light, it's very clever 
clever indeed because you don't ruin your night vision. The blue, I am told, is good for hunters because if you are hunting at night and following a blood trail, the blue is good for showing up the blood. And I guess that works. I don't know. I've never done that. So there's that. I can't figure out what you'd want the green for, although you might want to signal to somebody down there that everything's okay suddenly. So perhaps a green signal might be good if that pertains to your job or whatever, but I wouldn't see myself particularly using the green uh, from time to time, right? Just moving on, you get this, uh, I'll show it to you if you like, you get this big hunkin' 5,000 milliamp hour battery. It's a type 21700. So there's a lot of electrical energy built into that. It's a special Olight one, and I guess that's because the high discharge rate at 700, uh, 1750 lumens requires this special battery. I wouldn't put a non Olight battery in there for that purpose. And there's a really nice O ring seal here, which affects the IPX8 waterproofing, and it's also rated to survive a 1.5 meter uh, drop, which is fantastic as well, because if you're using it in a rugged environment, maybe it's cold, maybe you're wearing gloves, maybe it's raining, whatever, it's kind of likely that from time to time, you might drop it on something hard, and you want it to function after that. Dual switches, of course, you, you know, you get your half press for a little bit of light, and then your 1750 with a full press on the back, and you don't need very much muscle memory to make that happen so the silicon wand is pretty good and not just for signaling right i think you could use this very effectively indeed as a lantern right like if you are using this torch uh, you know you've got a problem under your engine bay or you want to uh, fix a spare tire or you know, fit the spare tire or something of that nature then having this sort of soft enveloping light could be much better than just shining a really bright light and you can kind of just throw it on the ground and let the 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 light illuminate whatever it is that you're working on you have both hands free so that's kind of clever as well and uh, incidentally if you've ever seen uh statues of freya in Sweden. Freya's a, a Norse god, a famous Norse god, right? And if you've ever seen uh, statues of Freya in Sweden, you'll know why they called this flashlight that. And uh, that's all I'm saying on this, being a family show and all, but those crazy Vikings, you know, all those activities that they uh, undertook, feasting, feeding, finagling, things like that, kind of explains a lot vis-a-vis -vis the name and you can charge it in the car so that's kind of brilliant anyway 40 percent off the freya by until midnight tonight and then there's, there's a link in the description for that if you're interested i don't want to hard sell you on it but i've been sitting on this for a couple of weeks and i was just really pleased when i learned that the embargo lifted at midnight uh last night and you can pick one up before christmas now and i think you know for a quality product like this 135 bucks with 40 percent off is excellent value even Olight, as I said, is magnet obsessed, and even the holster, right? Magnets, right? They're really good with the packaging. And if you don't have the silicon wand inside the holster, I believe you can even charge the flashlight through the hole in the bottom of the holster without even taking it off. So you can fit the charger like that, which is pretty clever as well. Obviously, you can't charge it like that with the silicon wand connected, and I'd be keeping the bits together because if you're anything like me, it's so easy to lose the parts if they're not automatically stored. So there's that link in the description. And if you miss the sale, which runs until midnight tonight, there's a code in the description that will allow you to get 10% off between now and essentially the heat death of the universe, which is also nice. Let us work with the uh, automotive news now, shall we? And the funniest story lately, which popped up yesterday in a news feed called Auto News, is that Ford Trends Report for 2021 has been released by the Ford Motor Company, okay? And my gut reaction to that is, why did they bother, you know? Ford Trends Report finds consumers resilient and adaptive amid the pandemic. Like, come on, dudes. Is that the best you've got? I don't want news like this from Ford. I want news about Fords and what the company's doing and how they're going to make the products better and are they going to start supporting customers better in Australia? That's what I really want. Um, 
a great quote here which illustrates, in my view, everything wrong with corporate communications. This is from a wheel at Ford Motor Company, not in Australia, but globally, okay? As we barrel into 2021 and look forward to a post-pandemic world, it's clear that the changes brought about by COVID-19 have changed us, but to what degree? Up front, I would say, why ask a question if you're the one giving us the answers in this report, okay? Like, this is like Journalism 101, okay? And th that's from Cheryl Conley, who's the Global Consumer Trends and Futuring Manager for the Ford Motor Company. And to the Ford Motor Company, I would say, if you actually need a futuring manager, A, futuring's not a word, and if you need one anyway, then dudes you're getting a bit too heavy at, up the top in the management structure. Like, concentrate on making better cars and concentrate on looking after people better and just roll out the product and tell us about that, I humbly suggest. Moving on in the news domain, if you want to know more about any of this stuff, of course, uh, just let me know in the chat and I'll detail it for you. I can just call up the release and let you know. I'm always kicking Land Rover in the slats, you might have noticed, about their poor customer support and terrible reliability. But... Oddly enough, good news stories uh, abound for Land Rover at the moment in the news domain. They've just taken some of their hard-earned cash and gone what they call above and beyond, which is a big Land Rover catchphrase. They've uh, entered into a partnership with Life Flight, and they say, that was on the 15th they announced that, in, in Brisbane. They say a new highly advanced, specially configured helicopter designed to take on the most challenging missions is operational and ready to respond around the clock to emergencies anywhere in Australia. So that's quite nice of Land Rover to do that and props to them. I don't know how one specially configured helicopter can hope to respond to emergencies all over Australia because it's like 4,000 kilometres across Australia and it's also 4,000 kilometres from the top to the bottom. And a helicopter is not exactly the best device for getting uh, those long distances unless you put it inside a large cargo jet and carry it to where you really need it. I guess that could work, but doesn't seem very practical and of course it doesn't matter how you, how fast you want a helicopter to go there are these fundamental speed limitations to helicopters that don't pertain to jets for example it's really bad if the advancing tip of the rotor <laughs> breaks the sound barrier right that's kind of bad and it's also bad if the in concert with the forward speed okay so what you end up with is the rotating disc above and the forward speed of the aircraft and the advancing blade goes faster in terms of airspeed and the retreating blade goes slower right so it's bad if the advancing blade uh, breaks the sound barrier as it draws alongside the pilot or something and it's also quite bad if the retreating blade stalls if either of those two things happen Helicopters don't fly too well, so they have to operate within this sort of speed envelope, and there's no way they can break the sound barrier like that. Speaking of the sound barrier, very sad to hear about a week ago now the death of Chuck Yeager, the guy who actually broke the sound barrier, the key figure in Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. Okay, he was 97, I think, so. Uh, everyone's got to go eventually and he lived an amazing life he was still flying jets well into his dottage as it were you know on the 50th and 55th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier in the bell x1 i think he did it again in i think they were f-15 eagles but Correct me on that if I'm wrong. I'm just doing that from memory. Moving along, uh, Hyundai announced on the 15th the details relating to the new 2021 Santa Fe. And this is a really weird product evolution from them because the 2019 model, which I own and sitting just out there in the driveway, that's only been here for a couple of years. And now the new model on the new platform co-shared with Sorento is here. And the big news there, which I discussed the other day, is essentially the two and a half ton token capacity specified by Hyundai for Santa Fe versus the two-ton tow capacity for Sorento. And that's based on individual product planning decisions made locally here in Australia uh, by the local product planning team. So one team thinks two and a half tons is acceptable. The other team thinks two tons is acceptable. They might both be right. Who knows? Uh, six new Mercedes EQ vehicles are going to be launched by 2022. I hope they are somewhat less cynical than the EQC, which won the Wheels Magazine Car of the Year so entertainingly a year ago, right? Um, 
Moving on, we've got the BMW X5 M and X6 M competition first edition models uh, now available to reserve exclusively online. So if you've got too much money and you want to spend it on yourself for Christmas, they'd probably be quite entertaining vehicles to own, I guess. But where would you ever drive them in the manner that their maker intended the car industry is issuing another warning via their grubby little lobby group in Canberra, the FCAI. They're issuing a warning about counterfeit parts again, and they say that online counterfeit parts markets are flourishing, according to brand protection firm Core Search. And this places Australian road users at higher risk of harm from low quality fake parts that may be fitted to their vehicles without their excuse me, without their knowledge. So Here's what I would say to the FCAI. I would say that in the past, you guys have done an excellent job muddying the distinction between alternative parts and fake parts. Like fake parts are parts which are made by some third party and they purport to be the genuine part, right? They're knockoffs, in other words. And that is immoral, unethical, illegal, and potentially dangerous. I get that. But the thing that the FCAI is doing and has done to date, to my knowledge, with their corporate communications on counterfeit parts is essentially what they do there is they muddy the distinction between counterfeit parts and High quality, genuine, uh, high quality alternative to the genuine parts, right? So non-genuine parts, not purporting to be genuine parts, like a Ryko air filter, for example, and as opposed to a genuine Toyota or whatever air filter. They're quality parts from other manufacturers that do essentially the same job and are fit for purpose. So shame on them for doing that, at least in my view. I don't know what you think about that, but we should stamp on counterfeits, but we should also have a market full of choice for you so that you don't just get ripped off with a one-stop shop that's the genuine part only, because frankly, that would be terrible, at least in my view. Uh, Mitsubishi has released uh, the first teaser of the all-new Outlander, so if you want to look at that, you just Google all-new Outlander. Outlander's quite old now, and I'll be interested to see when the release time frame is for the new one and how much better it in fact is. On the 11th of this month, Hyundai released details of the all-new Palisade, which is their most expensive model, up to about 80 grand, I believe. And uh, I'm looking forward to driving one of them uh, shortly before Christmas for a couple of weeks, and I'll let you know exactly what I think about that at that time. Um, Mazda also has announced details of its MX-30 mild hybrid and electric models for 2021 release. And to that, I'd say I'd be interested to see what Mazda does with their electric models, because that'll be a first for them, at least here in Australia. And uh, I'm not that enthusiastic at all about their mild hybrids, because I think they are the most cynical exercise. It's just an opportunity to use the word hybrid in marketing with the minimal amount of hardware on board to justify the use of that term. And uh, not all that much benefit, frankly, for consumers. So there's that. Now, uh, that's the other, the, oh, the only other one I really wanted to mention to you was that there's a five-star ANCAP safety rating just been awarded, or at least this month has been awarded for the new Land Rover Defender. So that pretty much brings you up to speed, I think, in the automotive domain. And now I'd like to throw the floor open to you and your questions. And I'll be here for the next, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes or something and available to try and help you out if I possibly can. So let me have it in the chat. Darth Vader here and, and also just up there, Uncle Darth. You know, I've been praying to Uncle Darth for months and months now. I used to pray to Jesus, and Uncle Darth answers my questions roughly as often as Jesus did. Go figure. I don't know why. Um, Darth Vader says, Ford customers, resilient and adaptive, says to me that Ford customers have decided that there are better brands to deal with and chosen to go elsewhere. I did. Look, I think plenty of people like this, and I've done a report recently on Ford's strategic vulnerability in Australia, right? Uh, obviously, at the corporate level with the North American manufacturers, they're kind of running away from right-hand drive anyway. They don't see the point. And I get that. Most of the world is left-hand drive, economies of scale and the degree of difficulty. And the fact that, frankly, you can make left-hand drive cars better 
if you don't platform share them for right-hand drive architecture because you know you can make the right-hand drive footwell bigger and you can shrink the uh, sorry you can make the left-hand footwell at the front bigger and you can shrink the right-hand one to uh, increase the uh, the packaging for the control architecture for the driver right and you can't do that if you platform share for left and right drive you have to make the two halves symmetrical and there's inherent compromises involved there things of that nature as well right you can also do the crash engineering slightly differently because many of the offset frontal aspects of crash testing and also the side crash testing occurs on the driver's side so in markets where there are left and right hand drive models you have to make them both sides equally resilient whereas if you're designing only for right hand drive and crash testing inside that sort of um, ecosystem, then it's the right-hand side that you have to beef up and you can place fundamental components inside the engine bay in the manner that protects that right-hand side better from those crash tests. I don't know that that does a particularly good job for the passenger sitting on the right-hand side of the vehicles, but hey, you can do that if you're a car maker and you're only making left-hand drive products. So I get that. And also, look, here in Australia, without Ranger and the Everest, which is derived from Ranger, Ford would already be essentially insolvent, unsustainable, whatever you want to call it, because their sales are so dramatically skewed towards Ranger and that derivative that if you took that away, the business model essentially collapses, the dealers would be unsustainable, and Ford would be going, in my view at least, seemingly the way of Holden. There wouldn't be a reason to have it here, which would be sad for competition, but I'm not the hugest fan of all time of the way that Ford does business in Australia. They're not renowned for A, reliability and they're not renowned for B looking after their customers particularly well so thanks Uncle Darth for one of those rare uh, questions at least not an answer to a prayer this time but a question or a comment relating to Ford Fuyin Nguyen says hi John advice on a second car that will be used infrequently mostly shopping when the primary car is occupied any suggestions for some cheap $5,000 thing or do I need to go up higher no I don't think you do you can buy yourself a somewhat used chitois and I'd suggest you know something like a pretty used Kia Rio might do the job or even an i30 or Serata. you'd have to go back in time a fair way and you'd be looking at I don't know a, a 10 year old car and in that case what I'd do would be I'd be shooting for the lowest possible K's on the clock I'd be taking it to an independent mechanic for an independent assessment of its uh, state of health and then I'd be making a decision based on that but look if you're only going to go shopping, you're probably only going to be 5 or 10 k's from home ever. If it breaks down, it's not a disaster. And the maximum risk that you're entering into here is five grand. So if a major component fails and the car is unsustainably, or it's uneconomical to repair, then you can just get rid of it, you know, and you can scrap it. And then, you know, that's not a financial disaster. Whereas, I get other people who say, what do you think about buying a, a second-hand ML-class Mercedes-Benz or an Audi S6? And I just go, dude, they are quite cheap, but have you looked at the cost of the spare parts? If the transmission fails, it's like the national debt. So there you go. That's what I'd do there. I'd just choose one of those common cars. Toyotas are good too, like uh, a, a Corolla, for example, or, you know, um, the the smaller one with the uh, the Yaris okay you can look for a Yaris even to do that how heavy is the shopping how many people are going to go shopping just run your Yaris or something into the ground dude and then when it dies go again and if it costs you five thousand if five thousand bucks it lasts you five years it's uh, it's cost you a thousand bucks a year which is 20 bucks a week which is cheaper than a taxi okay so that's the kind of uh, that's that's the kind of arithmetic I'd be doing in relation to that old hat man says John Bought a Triton club cab tray via you recently. Was going to do adaptions. I think he means modifications, but found the Triton a good uh, lift height, tires good, all, ta all terrain type, good so far. Thanks. Yeah, look, I'd suggest that the way to go with modifying any car, right? A lot of men, particularly, lie awake fantasizing about modifications prior to the purchase, and they've got this fantasy list of modifications, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, just knock yourself out if that's what you want to do. But 
what I would strongly suggest in the domain of those kinds of fantasies is don't act on them, right, until it becomes clear based on owning the car for some time and using it in the manner in which you want to use it that some modifications are necessary. Like if you're buying a Triton to go four-wheel driving with, I'd be taking it four-wheel driving in standard trim first. And then if it's good enough, then don't change a thing. And obviously the first thing you might want to change is the tyres because they're probably going to limit the off-road performance more than anything else. And they're also the easiest thing to change. And then incrementally you can go down the track towards modifying it more and more and more if you really need to. But I'd say what you need to think about when you do extensive sort of modifications is that you can easily find yourself in a situation where there are feedback effects. Like if you give the thing a massive lift and you put these huge hunking tires on it, right, the speedo is going to be out. It's going to drive terrible on the open road. The tires are going to be noisy. It's not going to corner particularly well for the majority of driving you do, which is on made roads. So it's going to be a bit of a safety liability. The additional ride height is going to place additional stresses on the universal joints because the angle of attack or the, the angle through which the universal joints have to work is increased and that increases their wear rate. So you're going to be endlessly chewing things of that nature out. And the cornering dynamics are going to change too because cars are set up so that their sus fundamental suspension components operate with the wheels kind of, you know, straight up and down. And if you lift the car up, you're going to change the orientation of all of those suspension arms. And then when they move more through the suspension travel, when they move in one particular way, usually into droop, then the radius of those arms really is going to make the wheel move a lot. And that can lead to some fairly horrible transient sort of handling effects. So I wouldn't be doing that kind of stuff off the bat unless you are making something particularly specialised and you really need to do that with it. I'd be opting for, if it's a daily driver that you occasionally take four-wheel driving, keep it as standard as possible, dude. So I'm glad you're approaching that in a rational way. That makes absolute sense to me. Master Trade Skills says, Hi, John, what would you consider reasonably durable for the internal evaporator of a car's air conditioning unit? Bought the new Holden Barina in 2014. The evaporator has now failed or leaked. Six years old. It depends what the repair cost is, doesn't it? You know, I'd be suggesting that consumer law says, you know, everything's got to have a reasonable durability. Some parts are going to sort of fail within six years and it might be poor design, but if it's a few hundred dollars worth of failure, then is it worth fighting if the uh, if the car maker gives you, uh, gives you grief over it? Probably not. But Holden is an interesting case right now, isn't it? Because, you know, their dealer network has evaporated. They're really just servicing shops now. I don't think they're going to be whipping out the red carpet and doing all they can for you because just nature of the beast. So there you go. Anyway, I'm, I'm not sure what the reasonable life of an air conditioning evaporator is, but I'd be thinking the reasonable life of most components not subject to wear and tear in a car would be 10 years or about 160,000 Ks, that's kind of where I'd be ballparking it. So I'd be I'd be making a demand upon the dealer, frankly. I'd be saying you failed to meet the reasonable durability requirements of the acceptable quality guarantee under Australian consumer law, and I expect you to offer me a free repair, you know. And then all that, <laughs> what's the worst thing that can happen? They can say, no, dude, and then you'll be paying for it anyway. And it doesn't hurt to do that. And, you know, if... If that is all the case, that the reasonable durability provisions have not been met, then you will get a free repair. And it's, is it worth writing a letter for a couple of hundred bucks? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I'd be doing that. So QA Library says... Ford in the UK have said they're uh, closing down the last of UK car production and moving to EU area, the BMMA, BM. Yeah, I love that. 57-year-old eyesight, yes. Said 80% of manufacturing will leave the UK due to Brexit. Yeah, well, I don't know too much about Brexit, although I, I do get the impression that overall it's kind of a bad idea for the UK. And, uh, 
I didn't see it being particularly broken, although I have not spent all that much time in the UK. I've never lived there. I don't really understand the granular detail of domestic policy. And I also don't really know what the average person in the street in the UK thinks about Brexit. So it'll be a shame if it's a net negative for things like manufacturing in the UK because a viable manufacturing industry is good for economic health. And I can say that with some certainty because, hey, we don't really have one anymore in Australia and it's a friggin' disaster. So there's that. Andy Burnett now, who's a regular, says, can we get hold of the 2020 FO shirt from the designer? Any suggestions on this? I'm going to talk to my lawyer about whether or not that is a trademark infringement because I don't know trademark law and no, no any similarity to, you know, lubrication and or corrosion protection products in the market now is entirely coincidental. P.S. I love WD-40 and everybody who ever watches a video of mine should go out prior to Christmas and buy 20 litres of WD-40. I declare it as your next prime mincer, okay, because it is awesome stuff and uses are being form, you know, found for it even today, despite the fact that there are thousands upon thousands now. But no similarity between that shirt and any product in that domain is intended, obviously. But I'm going to talk to my lawyer about trademark infringement and how that works. That's not something I know a great deal about. And in the new year, in the post-pandemic 2021, I hope to launch some Make Australia Less Shit Merchandise. In addition to some 2020 or 2021 FO merchandise, because uh, you might enjoy that. And who knows, it might be good for just a bit of a laugh. Um, Douglas Lamb says, hi, John, I'm looking at buying LDV T60 Megatub. What might be your thoughts? It will only be for carting my work gear. Some of my so-called mates say I'm nuts. Well, I'd look at it like this, Douglas. It's going to be cheaper than the uh, established mainstream competitors in the ute domain. And... Sorry if I keep wiping my face here. It's it's a little bit less humid uh, today now than it was yesterday. It's only a billion percent humidity. It was five billion percent humidity here in the fat cave. Uh, yesterday, it's only a billion now, so I'm just sort of rolling with it and shrugging it off as if it's just trivial. But hey, uh, look, it is cheaper, okay? It's definitely cheaper to buy an LDV, and they use some quality components and the crash test results were okay i believe and uh, for all these reasons maybe it's a good idea the two and the sales are really climbing too so they are trying and whatever they are trying has been quite effective so there's that the only question marks for me are customer support reliability and resale value and this of course is the gauntlet you run as an early adopter of anything but if you want to save a bit of money up front there they do seem to be kicking a bit of a goal so if that growth continues that uh, augurs well for demand which augurs well for resale value into the future and hopefully the importer will look after you if there's a problem and hopefully the product will be reasonably reliable as well so there's all of those things to consider and it's look it's a decision that only you can make everyone is happy with a particular level of risk and if you're happy with that level of risk over reliability support and resale value then yeah go for it because you're going to save a bit of money up front you might take a bath on resale but you know, I, I don't see it being an unmitigated disaster, okay? So it certainly will, if you're running a business, okay, the cost now is probably quite relevant and you can probably write that off, you know, if you're carting your work gear around and you're able to depreciate it like that, it's just going to be less capital outlay, which is always pretty good. And the performance is going to be okay in the context of using it for work. It's not going to be a range of wild track, anytime soon right uh, it's not going to be a triton uh, with the super select gearbox but you know you pay through the neck for that kind of tech don't you so and tosh uh pandy now and i recognize that name you're a regular antush antush antosh i don't know how to pronounce that so apologies for mangling your name i, I see your name all the time in the comments thank you very much for being a, le a, a, a royal <laughs> royal regular a regular viewer Need to slow down with the chat sometimes to get this right. 
Entus says, hey, John, can I mix different manufacturers' tyre pair in my car? Currently a front tyre Bridgestone B250 18560 R15s. Want to fit new Michelin tyres in front and move old 5K Rand tyres to the rear? Yeah. Essentially, in most mainstream cars, it doesn't hurt to mix brands. Just make sure that the the tyres you fit are kind of direct competitors. Okay, so if you've got high-performance tyres, right, fit high performance tires if you've got medium sort of performance tires just make sure that they're the tires have the same size the same intent same load rating don't fit a medium performance tire in the same size to a high performance pair at the other end other than that you can certainly mix bridgestones michelins pirellis whatever i wouldn't mix them side to side uh, front to rear, yeah, okay, no problem with that. If you're doing an all-wheel drive car, some all-wheel drive cars in the owner's manual say that you need to replace all four tyres at once because they don't want the tyres turning at different rates, okay? So if your manual says that, cop it on the chin, son, and replace all four. Otherwise, it could lead to a hideously expensive repair scenario. Now, Gerard Alphanumeric String says... Hi, John. I'm contemplating the purchase of a new Santa Fe when it arrives. My question is, would you tow with a new Santa Fe diesel a caravan with an aggregate trailer mass of 2,140 kilograms? Thanks. Yeah, I would, because I did a tow test on the previous Santa Fe, and I had the genuine lift, uh, genuine load assist kit, they call it. I had them fit that and an electric brake controller, and we put two-ton trailer which was a lightweight car carrying trailer with an i30n on the back of it and that was two tons exactly or 1995 kilos this is the previous platform with the 2.2 diesel and the uh, epicyclic auto okay and the tow ball download was 150 kilos in that case which was also the maximum with the genuine load assist kit and it was a breeze like if you towed conservatively, we took it to Brooklyn and uh, on the freeway, which is a vertical height drop of like 200 metres over a, quite a short span. So you go down quite a, a steep freeway section, then you climb back up a steep freeway section. And you can do the same thing on the old Pacific Highway, which is the same climb, but extremely windy and uh, the speed limit there, 80 kilometres an hour. And we did both several times for the filming. And it was a breeze, okay? So the new one's going to be better. And it's rated higher anyway. There's no reason to suspect that it can't tow up to its maximum of two and a half tonnes and two tonnes on the tow ball download. If your van is 2,100 and whatever aggregate trailer mass, then I would absolutely make sure that you do not exceed the 200 kilo static tow ball download limit. And that might actually be more challenging for you to achieve than the, the mass, the overall aggregate trailer mass. Just make sure that you're inside both of those limits. And you'll be okay. I, I see no reason why that's not possible. And perversely, I would not do this with a Sorento purely because it's a breach of the manufacturer's claimed tow capacity, despite the fact that the platforms are shared. I'm pretty sure the Sorento would do that. And I'm not privy to the underlying engineering uh, rationale behind the decision by both of those manufacturers. But basically, that's how I'd play it. I think you'll be fine, subject to the tow ball download requirement of 200 kilos being met. Really important to know this before you buy the vehicle, because otherwise it's a disaster, right? If you've got the van now, measure the tow ball download using tow ball download scales at using the caravan loaded to its most heavily loaded configuration before you drop a deposit on the vehicle. Okay, make sure you do it in that order. Don't try and pick up a train wreck after you've spent the big bucks. Very, very important to do it that way. Okay, now uh, let's get to a uh, let's get to a decent question here, if possible. We've got uh, Brendan Wheatley who says I'm considering purchasing a Mazda RX-8. Are all the negative comments of this vehicle true? Well. I remember RX-8 when it was new and it was kind of exciting to drive and it's a bit of a cult classic because of the rotary, right? So if you really want one, then do what I said just a few moments ago and get an experienced rotary 
uh, qualified, specialised, whatever mechanic to have a look at that car and make sure you are just not opening the worst version of Rotary Pandora's box. But if you lust after that car and you really want one, then you have to, it's like entering into any other relationship. You just have to take the good with the bad, right? You have to love the good and you have to tolerate the bad. And things like, you know, some of the idiosyncrasies of rotary engines and their reliability issues and things of that nature, they are definitely the less than perfect aspects of rotary ownership. You have to expect those negative acts, uh, aspects of ownership to occur and you have to not feel betrayed when they do because, hey, you sign up for the whole thing, right? That's uh, essentially how I would play that. Now, uh, thank you very much, Douglas. I appreciate your kind donation. I, I I don't need to be paid to answer your questions, mate, but thank you very much. Anyway, Big Hostile says, um, Hey, John, H-A-Y, John, looking at buying the current 2020 200 series Land Cruiser, but I'm not sure whether to wait for the 300 series to come out. What are your thoughts on this? Okay. The 200 series is a done deal. We know everything there is to know about it. It's a pretty good bus. It's dated now. It's like whatever it is, 14 years old or 12 or something. So it's not exactly cutting edge, but the problems are known and the performance is known. The reliability is known. You know everything about it. When they release the 300 series next year, it's likely going to be a largely new platform. It's going to have different powertrains, okay? And it's going to have to be in service for some time until we figure out whether Toyota shot itself in the foot and you with reliability or whether it's just going to be the perfect Land Cruiser you've always wanted, right? So if you're going to buy one now, you might get a run out, pretty good deal, and you'll know what you're getting. And if you're going to buy a new one, I'd strongly suggest waiting at least six months after the launch to see what's happening in respect of existing owners because you don't want to open the door to a 2.8 diesel DPF failure kind of cataclysm, which afflicted Hilux, Fortuna and Prado recently, okay? You don't want to open the door to owning one of that. And Toyota's got form, okay? They've got a track record for doing that kind of thing recently, and I would not give them the benefit of the doubt on the 300 series, okay? What I do is wait. So it's either like, buy a 200 now, dude, or wait until 2022 and then jump into the 300 if there's evidence that it's not going to betray you, okay? There's every evidence that it's going to go better than or just as well as the 200, despite having a six-cylinder engine instead of the V8 that the 200 currently enjoys. That's just the nature of um, engine technology. There's no doubt that a V6 can outperform the current V8 in Land Cruiser, and a lot of people like the idea of a V8, but trust me, all that really matters is a broad RPM range power performance you know, and reliability. So let's hope they manage to package both of those things into the new 300, but I would not give them benefit of the doubt. I would wait and see. So Darth Vader's back again now too. <laughs> Responses from Uncle Darth in the one day after that deafening silence for years, despite all of those prayers. There you go. Um, perhaps a fan to cool you while on air in the fat cave would be good idea. Even one of those Ryobi jobbies would help. Yes, it would, but herein lies the rub with this kind of broadcast thing, okay? This microphone here, quite susceptible to little breezes, you know? They get that wind buffeting noise like nobody's business, and I would not subject you to that. And I don't really, I've got one just over there, but I don't want to jump off camera and grab it. I don't want to put a big foamy condom on top, you know, to to block the wind because this is already bulky enough, you know. And look, the main reason I use a microphone like this, incidentally, in case you're wondering about all of this kind of voodoo of talking, is this microphone, which you've got to get right up on to make it work and talk across so that you don't pop into it every time, okay, is, is really poorly receptive to ambient noise okay so there's these two big lights just there and there with two big dirty big soft boxes on them and they got really noisy fans it's actually very noisy in here and a billion actually a hundred billion friggin cicadas we're having one of those is it every seven years anyway every seven years at 10, 20 trillion <laughs> how long was that fish 20 trillion a uh, 40 trillion cicadas dig themselves out of the ground and just boost the uh, background noise level here to like, I'm sorry, what were you saying? 
like that. Like you can't have a frigging conversation when the humidity is like this and the sun beats down and it drives 50 trillion cicadas in functionally insane, right? So I've got this microphone like this right up on me so that you're not subjected to fan noise and cicada noise and all that crap. And I use a completely different kind of microphone when I'm just over here reading the prompter because in that situation I use a shotgun microphone which is highly directional and it just aims right at me and it's kind of off camera a bit. So anyway, they're just two different setups. This is more like a radio studio, obviously. There's all um, lots of noise in radio studios too. Producers walking in and out, paper rustling and them thrusting stuff down and ushering guests in and organising this and that so that's why they use these uh can uh, the condenser mics over there and they're just sort of normal whatever you call them mics here they're not powered in other words so they're not receptive to noises from further away anyway i don't know if you want to know any stuff about the broadcast environment not many people do it's not frankly that interesting but anyway now you know more about microphones than uh, you did previously i i hope anyway dcb says is it true by 2030 only EVs will be built by some car brands? Uh, how will it affect petrol vehicles in terms of purchasing price and selling price and demand for these petrol cars when selling? Frankly, I think that's a bit of a pipe dream. I, I don't see the industry changing that dramatically by 2030. The EU is talking about uh, only being uh, passing legislation only allowing the sale of electric vehicles by 2030, but I can't see the world's biggest oil producers, uh, including North America, I can't see them running away from internal combustion anytime soon. I can't see us doing it here in Australia because we can't even... Uh, we can't even introduce uh, fuel quality standards and emissions control standards and greenhouse gas emissions targets in a timely fashion. We can't even get the government to admit climate change is a friggin' thing, despite all of the overwhelming scientific evidence to the contrary. You know, like, come on, dudes. Um, it's not going to change here anytime soon. And the average car in Australia is about 10 years old. So in 10 years' time, the average car in Australia Australia is going to be like a new car now and like what is it one in 35 cars is a hybrid and statistically everything else is internal combustion and electric vehicle sales here is about that and I've been driving a Kona electric for several months now and 7,000 kilometers and I really do enjoy driving it. It's not perfect, but and it is quite expensive for what it is, but I do enjoy driving it. And every time I get back into one of my diesel vehicles, I've got a Triton and a Santa Fe diesel, and every time I get back into one after driving the Kona Electric for three or four days or something, I get in it and I go, all this vibration, what is that, you know? So... I'm not a hater of electric vehicles. I'm a hater of the way some car companies like Nissan, for example, are treating early adopters of vehicles like the first generation Leaf. I hate the way they do that. It's immoral and unethical in my view. But I'm not a hater of EVs. I'm not sure they're tremendously... Uh, green from a carbon point of view, given that the batteries need to be manufactured and given that the payback period for, you know, life cycle analysis is so long into the future. Um, I don't think there's an economically rational case for EVs. There certainly is in terms of air quality and energy security, though. Uh, so, you know, these are nuanced issues and we need to think about that and talk about that. But by 2030, I don't see there being an appreciable difference in the way availability is... Uh, availability, price, resale, all of those things impacts on internal combustion here in Australia. It might be profoundly different in the UK and the EU when that 2030 ban is enacted. I'm not sure. Let's just wait and see what happens. There's going to be some fairly pressing logistic impediments to making that happen though so there's that let's uh, move on to some more questions hey good questions today too dude so thank you very much I, I do appreciate all of that adam mansbridge now owner of an olight warrior mini says uh the cicadas here in canberra make an excellent imitation of automotive cyclical clicking yeah they do they probably drown out the odd politician too mate which is let's face it a bit of an advantage so he goes i wondered after pulling up at a drive through surrounded by cicadas whether i had serpentine belt pulley problem yeah i know exactly what you mean like if if they suddenly all went silent 
you'd wonder what was wrong with the world. You know, like the deafening silence might be subjectively louder than the noise of the cicadas. And it could be excellent practice for dealing with tinnitus too, couldn't it? I don't know. Maybe medical science could breed a few cicadas and put them in a special anechoic chamber and introduce more and more cicadas to you over a period of time so that you get to forget all about your tinnitus because you're already match fit for forgetting all about the cicadas. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Tamian Jones, who was uh, regular yesterday too, says, can you tell us what the clicking noise is that you have here uh, periodically in your pre-recorded shows? No, I can't. I don't know exactly what that is. It's not part of the tech here because when I'm not doing a show and I test the tech without going live, it doesn't occur. So I can't tell you what that clicking noise is, but I can tell you that uh, internet type live streaming is not perfect and uh, that's it's not really a YouTube thing either. I'll just do a speed test for comparison here because um, I tested the speed of the internet stream here just before going live and it was kind of interesting. But the NBN is certainly not perfect. We've got the fastest uh, NBN connection that I can purchase here. It's not fiber to the node. It's you know cable to the node and then fiber to the whatever. And... Uh, it's not a speed thing because I'm just looking now they're doing the download test. It's like 92.6 megabits per second on the way down and about 30 on the way up megabits per second. And the stream I use only requires four and a half megabits per second up. OK, so the way I'm 35 now. So the way I'm looking at it, you know, four and a half, I'm about more than seven times faster in terms of upload speed than I need to be. But every time I go live, and I can't drill down into the bottom of this except to say that the NBN shits me, I get a uh, the, the odd periodic warning on the YouTube interface here, but now I've got a message that says excellent connection. So all I can foresee is that there's momentary congestion in the upload stream as other users on this part of the network fire something off into the cloud and it impacts very briefly on the health of the stream, okay, at the risk of sounding like another one of those confidential conversations with your friggin' urologist, right? Uh, Skywalker now says, here in Germany, we are forced to buy small-sized engines and gas is expensive. Yes, that's true. It is. And he says, this is the law here. And in 2021, cars with big engines will be taxed with 50% more and electricity is also very expensive. See, I would have thought, Skywalker, that one of the best ways to uh, tax the consumption of the your big cars with large engines is just to put large amounts of tax on fuel. And clearly in Europe, that is what happens. Because when I look at the price of gasoline globally, okay, we are very cheap here in Australia. We are like the, whatever it is, the fourth or fifth cheap uh, cheapest OECD nation on petrol price. And they're having bought uh, gasoline in Germany and Italy and places of that nature, it is very expensive. But when you drill down into the price per litre of petrol all over the globe, the difference between, for example, Australia and Europe is the tax component. The liquid itself is very similarly priced, okay? So what I can infer from that is that it's a really effective way to discourage the excessive consumption of fuel using high-performance cars with big engines that are very thirsty by just putting more tax on fuel. You don't have to have a road user tax, a kilometre tax, or any of that crap. You just need to get the tax component of the fuel right, and then the user pays. And you can choose, right? You get the freedom of choice. You choose a big, heavy, thirsty car if you've got lots of dough and you don't care about spending that money and paying that tax. And that's the penalty that uh, society generally uh, decides is reasonable for that decision. And then you can choose to buy a fuel efficient car that's small with an efficient engine and you can save money on that tax by not paying it. OK, so to me, it just seems brilliant to put the tax on fuel and to get the tax on fuel right. OK, and that's one of the things we don't do here in Australia. We don't have a policy discussion about what is a fair tax on petrol. There'll be some people who say petrol's too expensive here in Australia. Newsflash. It's not. It's absolutely not. It's very cheap. And in the context of value, 
as opposed to price, i.e. what that fuel allows you to do. It's virtually free, okay? I'm going to say that again. Fuel is virtually free in the context of value. I live three kilometers from the nearest shopping center. It's a trivial trip in a car, okay? And it takes me three minutes at 60 k's an hour sort of thing. I can't drive at 60 the whole way. The speed limit's 50, but let's say it takes me five minutes to get to the shops, okay? If I were to walk there with a wheelbarrow, it would take me half an hour, I guess. You know, I, I could probably run there in 15, who knows? I'm not with a wheelbarrow. I'm probably not going to try to do that. Certainly not today, 27, 29 degrees and 5 trillion percent humidity. How long was that fish? Anyway, then, of course, you're going to load up with, I don't know, 30 kilos or something, maybe not that much, maybe 10, 15 kilos of groceries. And you're going to have to sprint back, aren't you? So that the chicken doesn't go off and the ice cream doesn't melt and the butter doesn't turn to oil or something, okay? Contrast that with driving in a car, which is going to be 10 minutes in total transit time, in air-conditioned comfort, your chicken's not going to be rotten, your ice cream's still going to be frozen, your butter's still going to be relatively solid, okay? And five kilometres is going to cost you like it's half a litre of gasoline in an average car, which is going to cost you like 60 cents, you know, now which one of those do you want to do? Do you think it's good value to dust off the frigging wheelbarrow and sprint at least half of the total journey? You know, is that good value? Or do you just think the 60 cents is frigging trivial? And if you think the 60 cents is trivial, then my strong suggestion is stop bitching about the price of fuel. Because compared with the coffee that you bought this morning from an espresso bar, you know, your double decaf soy latte with 57 teaspoons of aspartame in it or whatever, or, you know, half a litre of caramel syrup. I'd suggest the fuel was cheap also. So there's that. Anyway, do you get the feeling like this might be a soapbox issue issue for me? Incidentally, it's a soapbox the box issue because I've done so many crosses on Channel 7 about the price of petrol. There are executive producers on network TV who think, you know, the way we can make any story rate is make it relative to the price of petrol. It's such a ripoff, you know. It's not. It's not. Peter says, in the spirit of mouths, what can be done about the clowns that laughingly claim to represent us considering people don't seem to have enough sense to vote them out? Or what's the alternative, dude? I don't see there being uh, a dud party and a really good party and for some reason we're all so stupid that we choose the dud party. I see there being a dud party and a slightly less dud party. <laughs> you know, it's very slightly less. Equally dud at times. Like, where's the good choice? What we can do, I think, is advocate better. Each of us advocate better to our elected representatives, like our local members at state and federal level. What we've got in Australia is a bunch of whingers who don't want to engage with the process. You know, they don't, they're happy to criticise down the pub and say the joint's fucked, okay? But they're not happy to do anything tangible about it, put any effort into it, actually get a meeting with their local member and have a bit of a spray about what their local member should advocate for right? I see all of these people, they put solar arrays on the roof, they drive fuel efficient vehicles, they, they want to do the right thing for the future, for their kids, whatever, okay? They don't engage with the political process. That's a mistake. That's what we do, okay? As, uh, as a nation. And the other thing you should do, right? And I don't know how educated you are. I've benefited from a fairly high level of education with a degree in engineering. I think, uh, it's extremely important as a nation that we educate more and more of our young people in applied science because the difference between going back to being cavemen and living the lifestyle that we enjoyed is applied science. It's a meme, right? You don't start, you don't emerge from the womb with any greater intellect than a, a baby did 100,000 years ago when the standard of living was, <laughs> let's face it, pretty different. And ambient technology was pretty different too, right? What you emerge into is a world built on a foundation of hundreds of years of scientific inquiry. The reason we don't die more often in childbirth is science. The reason we don't die more prematurely throughout life is science. The reason we have 
better medical technology is science okay the reason we have better shelter better whatever better search and rescue better better everything show me the thing that was better for cavemen and the answer is nothing nothing was better Health was worse. Any sort of fantasy about nutrition being better in the olden days, it's complete bullshit. Um, I mean, obviously, you can make bad nutrition choices in Australia and anywhere else in the developed world. You want to have McDonald's four times a day, knock yourself out, okay? But overall, everything is better. Safety is better. Personal safety is better. There's much less violence now, for example, and it's all down to structures put in place virtually exclusively by science. And when the frigging wheels fall off anything in society, guess what they don't do? They do, like we've just had the wheels fall off on society, haven't we? You know, it's been fairly significant the past few months. Who do they get together to solve this problem? It's not a bunch of lawyers and politicians and accountants, right? It's a bunch of scientists. It's always a bunch of scientists. When Apollo 13 says, Houston, we've just had a main bus be under vault. We're venting something into space. They don't get politicians and lawyers into the basement and say, right, we've got to figure out this carbon dioxide scrubbing problem. We've, how do we make the, how do we get these men back? <laughs> they get a whole bunch of proper rocket scientists and engineers, right? And they solve the friggin' problem. And that's what's got to happen today. And I am very passionate about this topic. So if you've got kids and they are um, predisposed to, you know, scientific inquiry, encourage the shit out of it and get them trained because the difference between, we could go back to being cavemen, right? Einstein said that. He said, I don't know about World War Three, but World War Four, sticks and stones, dead right, baby. We need more scientists and engineers to solve these amazing problems that are going to beset future generations, foreseeable generations, like my grandkids who don't exist yet, but my kids are going to face these problems. Your kids might as well, your grandkids might, and we need to get the best brains in the business. We need to get them engaged and we need asshole politicians to start encouraging that. And they don't see the benefit because, hey, for most of them, they're just like failed lawyers and they're in a debate club called frigging politics. And to me, it just sucks. That's why I would never be a politician. But we need more engineers and scientists in politics, too, who can just say, no, dude, that's bullshit. The world doesn't work that way. Climate change is real. You know, we need to do this. Air quality in our cities suck. And why are you not doing anything to introduce mandatory air quality standards? And how are we going to actually make that work? Like, you know, figure it out, dudes. Come on. Um, I'm going to keep going for a few more minutes now. I'm feeling like that was just a huge soapbox spray, so sorry about that. But anyway, maybe you're getting something out of it. hope you are. Thank you for sticking with me if uh, that was like an endurance event. Anyway, Daryl Dillette says, uh, Hello, John. Love your channel. Too bad. I've already purchased a Holden Captiva before I found this channel. Mate, I'm sorry to hear that. Nobody deserves that, particularly in 2020. Like, dude, it's been bad enough already. Holden Captiva, Holden Cruise, renowned lemons. If you are in the market for a used car, a good used car, scratch them off the list now. You don't know the pain you have potentially signed up for. Don't do this to yourself. I urge you. Now, Alex says, hey, John, can you please do an episode about hooping? That's an airbag helmet for cyclists. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. I haven't heard of it. Thank you very much for the heads up. Albert Kang says, Merry Christmas, holidays, and stay safe. Thanks, John. Thank you, Albert. Look, I'm just swamped at the moment, mate, and I do mean to get back to you. I have received emails, and I'm not trying to ignore you. Things are just a little bit hectic right now, mate, so that's how we are. Uh, Jason Sexton says, Interesting observation. Av, av annual... OPEC crude oil pr average annual OPEC crude oil price per barrel in 1980 equals 35 bucks ish and 2020 it's 40 ish bucks obvious it's been as high as 110 that was during the GFC I think anyway 10 years ago still pretty good value yeah it is like crude oil is not expensive and fuels a manufactured product obviously so 
You've got to put manufacturing and shipping costs on top of that. But uh, about half of a barrel of crude oil turns into gasoline and about a quarter of a barrel turns into diesel. And you've got to make it in a big refinery and ship it around the world. And then you've got to ship it locally by truck and decant it. And you've got to have a safe decanting system built in place in every filling station so that people don't burn themselves to death and blow themselves up, both of which are real uh, statistical problems with static electricity if you don't have robust systematic safeguards in place. So... Um, Another big tip on that, if you're going boating or just doing a whole bunch of yard work with two-stroke or four-stroke engines, little uh, little engines, and you need those little portable fuel containers, or you're going off-road and you're carrying any hydrocarbons in jerry cans, always remove them from the vehicle and put them on the concrete apron before you fill them up. Otherwise, you can introduce a static electricity charge via the filler neck, right? you got to earth the container. Do not fill it up on a trailer, in the boot, bed of a ute, whatever. Do some heavy lifting, dude. Get your jerry can down on the ground. Much harder to blow yourself up. And earth yourself to the container and the pump before you decant. And that way, there's no potential difference three ways, okay? You're all at the same potential. You can't spark it up. You can't blow yourself up. Nobody wants to do that. And incidentally, when you go to a filling station, speaking as a, an engineer, you probably don't think about it like this. Every time I go to a filling station without fault, I look around and I get my eyes on the extinguishers. I figure out where they are and I look at the little shack, whatever it is, the shop, whatever, and I look for the emergency shut-off switch because if someone blows himself up, okay, you've got to act really quickly. You've got to get the fire out. And if somebody crashes into a pump, loses control, crashes into a pump and it all erupts, you've got to get the pump off. There's no guarantee the dude at the console is going to have the presence of mind. He can manually shut things down from inside as well, but... 20% of people statistically can function in a crisis. There's an 80% chance that the dude who's accepting your credit card payment is not going to be able to be functional in that situation. He's likely to be going like that, slack-jawed for a, per a potential period. And I mean no disrespect to the people who do that job, which is probably challenging at times and certainly a bit brain-numbing, I'm sure. And they're doing it for a reason and you can't exist without fuel. We need those dudes. You're doing a good job. Thank you. I'm making an overall comment about human society. 80% of people cannot function in a crisis. So if you're at a fuel station, have a look around. Look for the fire extinguishers. Look at the emergency shutoff switch and just get eyes on those things in case you need them. And I hope you never do. So there's that. Um, moving on just briefly now. Jason, uh, we did Jason. I'm not going to do you twice, Jason. That would be you know, a violation. Skywalker's back. He says, could you talk a little about the car insurance in Australia? So about uh, the criteria of tax. No, I don't know what that question means. I mean, car insurance in Australia, what kind of car insurance, you know? Um, I, I don't really know what that question means, Skywalker. Sorry, dude. Um, let us have a look at the comments feed now and see if I haven't just missed anything worthwhile here. Keith Armitage is here. He says, hi, John. I have a Mitsubishi Triton MQ. Would it be okay to tow a 2,300 kilogram GVM caravan around Australia? It's a club cab with an alloy canopy. Okay. Here's the thing, Triton's for donkey's years have been rated at 3.1 tonne maximum tow capacity and 310 on the tow ball. I think you've got to be conservative about that because Triton does have a fairly large overhang between the axle and the tow ball location. So if the tow ball's too heavy, if you drive too aggressively, if you do all of these things in concert, you can bend the chassis and that's never good. So if you drive conservatively with a conservative caravan, if it just if it's a 2.3 ton AG, AGM, whatever you said, uh, ATM, then, yeah, I think you could absolutely get away with that. But the thing with towing, right, it's not just okay to get the numbers right. And certainly the numbers are conservative in that case, right? Keith, the numbers are dead conservative. You're 800 kilos under the limit. And if it's a two, uh, 230 kilo download, you're also like 80 kilos under the tow ball download limit. What you've got to do then is be uh, conservative with what you put in the vehicle. Don't get it up to its um, massive, some sort of massive GVM for the vehicle. Don't exceed the GVM. Realize that the tow ball download is part of the GVM. Okay, don't exceed the gross combination mass. I don't think there's much risk of that. And then drive conservatively. Okay, drive conservatively, dude. Yeah, you know, particularly on rough roads, particularly uh, at highway speeds, particularly downhill. 
don't do 100, 110, whatever the limit is, just because you can. If you're towing something heavy, knock it back 15 k's an hour over the limit or how you would otherwise drive conservatively in those driving conditions. Because the thing about towing is it can feel great, it can feel fine, can feel totally under control, and then suddenly it doesn't. Something happens and it doesn't. And speed is a real factor here in terms of losing control. So what you need to do is be driving at all times as a, at a conservative speed for, for the prevailing conditions because it's so easy for trailers to push the vehicle out of control in yaw and pitch and a combination of yaw and pitch. So if you're on a rough road with a lot of pitching going on, driving around a bend, if you fall into a dip, you know, wash away, something like that, and then there's a bit of up thrust at the wrong time and you're cornering, it's really easy for the trailer to nudge the vehicle in the worst possible way and you've got to be doing a conservative speed to minimize the inertial loads that cause that kind of loss of control so that's a bit of advice for you Keith but also for anyone else thinking about going away this Christmas I know it's allowed now and many of you will be towing caravans campers boats whatever you know do it conservatively and in particular downhill a lot of drivers think you know it's so frustrating because the powertrain's compromised on uphill sections. And then when you get downhill, it's so liberating because you can do 100 and 110 again, re depending on the uh, prevailing speed limit, right? But what's really happening here is you're opening the door to disaster on the downhill sections. It's not liberating at all. It feels liberating, perhaps, but you're placing yourself at risk. So always keep the speed down on the downhill sections. And this has the benefit of not frustrating the shit out of the world and his brother who's been held up behind you on the uphill sections. They've got to try and overtake you. And it's no good if you're suddenly doing 100 or 110 because they have to speed to get by. So do them a favour and yourself as well by maintaining a conservative speed in the downhill sections. And you'll also be doing your little bit to make Australia less shit by ramping down the ambient level of confrontation and angst and aggression and frustration out there on regional roads this holiday season. So do that and the world will be a better place. Look, thanks very much for joining me this morning. It's 10.45 in Sydney and some other time in Queensland because you don't do daylight saving, but at least we're on board with Victoria like that and everywhere else. If you're watching later, I'd really like to thank you for sticking by with the stream, either live or pre-recorded. And I do appreciate your company and your support. I'll be back to you soon. Thanks very much. See you soon. Have a good day.